today on Building the Open Metaverse. The heavens opened up and my purpose of life became clear. I must remake Carl Kohase's movie in color using shaded images and also include a model of the spacecraft. That movie got uh, shown on the evening news for all across the country. Just by luck being in the right place, uh, I was able to introduce the world at large to computer graphics. Welcome to Building the Open Metaverse, where technology experts discuss how the community is building the open metaverse together. Hosted by Patrick Cozy and Mark Petit. Hello, everybody, and welcome, Metaverse builders, dreamers, and pioneers. I'm Marc Petit, and this is my co-host, Patrick Kodzi. Hey, Mark. It's an honor to be here today and every day. So you are listening to Building the Open Metaverse Season 5, and this podcast, as you know, is your portal into open virtual worlds and spatial computing, bringing you the people and the projects that are on the front lines of building the immersive internet of the future, the open and interable metaverse for all. And today we have a special guest joining us on that mission. As you know, on this podcast, we like to look back to better understand how we can look forward. And back in the 70s, Jim Blinn devised new methods to represent how objects and light interact in three-dimensional three virtual worlds, like environment mapping and bump mapping. He is a true pioneer in computer graphics. So please welcome Jim Blinn to the show. Hello. Welcome, Jim. And it's really a special episode for us because as many of the things that we know, we've actually learned from your work. And I think it's worthy to take the time to hear about your journey. So please um, walk us through your, uh, your journey and your motivations. I grew up in a very small town in the middle of Michigan, uh, but I was able to uh, be interested. In, uh, basically, there are three things that sort of motivated me throughout my career. Um, one is science and especially astronomy. The other one is uh, animation. And the other one is teaching. Um, in the small town I was in, I was able to learn, you know, science and astronomy from books in the library, but also from some TV programs. Like there's the Bell Telephone series that was broadcast about that time, educational uh, videos on various things. Um, also animation. Of course, I watched a lot of animation in the mornings, Saturday morning. Uh, big fan of Disney and also uh, Walter Lance. Uh, they uh, both had... Uh, programs on their uh, programs that uh, actually described how the animation process worked. And so I uh, kind of learned how that worked from listening to them. And finally, there's teaching. Uh, for example, the uh, 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 Mad in Space program that this Disney produced uh, showed uh, how we're going to uh, explore uh, the solar system. Uh, and in fact, I kind of knew what they were teaching at the time, but I was fascinated by the idea that you could use animation to teach this stuff. So the whole idea of using animation to teach was uh, germinated by watching these programs. Uh, also, as, uh, the Bell Telephone series had uh, a bunch of science programs also with animation in it. A friend of mine and I actually uh, started doing animation using paper cutouts and uh, eight millimeter movie camera when I uh, was in uh, high school. and. <clears throat> The uh, um, that sort of worked. Uh, it turned out that we actually were doing a educational animation at the time. A lot of animations, if you look at them, uh, are sort of engineering exercises where the protagonist is trying to solve some problem. He tries one uh, thing and it doesn't work. He tries something else and it doesn't work. You know, Wiley Coyote is trying to find it, or uh, Tuttle Duck is trying to defeat the chipmunks or something like that. So uh, we got kind of the idea from that. Anyway, uh, ultimately, I went to uh, college at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. And uh, I'd like to say that I got into computers because I placed out of, uh, because I took French in high school. Because I uh, placed out of the foreign language requirement that they had in, at, uh, at the university. So I had uh, the second term in my freshman year, I had an empty spot in my schedule. So flipping through the... Uh, Flipping through the, the uh, course catalog, I came to something that's uh, computer science. I wonder what that is, computer programming. I'll sign up for that, see what it is. And I was immediately hooked. So uh, second term freshman year, I finished that up. And first and second term sophomore years, I uh, took the advanced programming courses, got into 360 assembly language programming. And uh, that fall, there was an announcement that a research project on, the, on, on campus was looking for a programmer who could do 360 assembly language programming in the engineering school. So I applied to that, and uh, they hired me. And they were doing a uh, 
a project of um, of uh, analyzing uh, what's called uh, chewing diagrams, uh, circuit diagrams. And my job at the time was basically to take the descriptions of what uh, the program should do uh, and translate that into assembly language, which I did. But the, the, the neat thing that they had was they had a uh, PDP-9-339 with a computer graphics display on it. That wasn't immediate my, my job, but I kept kind of peering at that and, and poking at the guy who was uh, in charge of that. His name was Jim Jackson. And finally, by the end of that summer, I got to be his assistant in work, writing a program that was the interactive program that would draw the circuit diagram on the screen and ship the data off to the main computer to analyze and then display the results. So that got me into computer graphics. And Jim Jackson and I have spent a lot of time experimenting with other sort of graphics sorts of things. Uh, we did some early uh, 3D line drawings of you know, 3D rotations and so forth in space, so forth. Um, and in fact, I did a lot of uh, computer simulations of, of uh, simple uh, physics uh, situ things like uh, uh, inter intermolecular forces between atoms that had circles on the screen bouncing around as a 2D atom simulator or uh, had a uh, program that simulated proton spin in a magnetic field with a 3D vector rotating around, so forth. Uh, but the neat thing about that was, um, well, the time I graduated in 1970, uh, all the graduate students had finished their PCs and left. And so the, the PD-59 still stayed around there. So that basically became my personal toy for the next four years. I had a personal computer that to, could do computer graphics. And so I you know, worked that thing to death, doing as many interesting things as I could. Uh, also did some uh, teaching of courses in uh, computer graphics at Michigan and so forth. But ultimately, I uh, found out about the University of Utah uh, project. One of my office mates had a, uh, a, a document that uh, was published by the Utah showing 3D shaded images, which I thought was so cool. And so uh, I ultimately applied to Utah for graduate school which uh, I got into, and so in 1974, I started at Utah. Um, at Utah, when I got there, uh, Jim Kajia was just finishing building the first uh, ENS frame buffer. They had a picture system which did 3D line drawings and hardware. I did a software simulation of that at Michigan, but this is hardware much faster. But the 3D uh, uh, stuff on the uh, picture system was really software. But I was able to get that going, uh, kind of like the first user of the system that uh, I got that going. What was interesting about that setup was that you got immediate feedback of what the shaded images was going to look like. The picture people in Utah had been doing uh, 3D shaded images for some time, but uh, they only were able to see the results by uh, a time exposure on film. And they had to get a film developed and they got a picture of what the single frame looked like. You were able to do some uh, movies, again, you know, repeated exposures on film. But since we had the frame buffer, you could see the results of your uh, image right away. And you could debug it right away. And so it's sort of like a next step in, you know, uh, interactive batch mode processing with punch cards, which, you know, with the program, you had to wait overnight to see the results. Then we had interactive terminals. You could see the results in a few minutes. Same now with visuals, with pictures. You could see those right away. So that made it so that I could uh, build on a lot of the work that you had done at, at the time. Um, uh, Tamil and Warnock and uh, Martin Newell, who became my thesis advisor, had done various things uh, using kind of the, the slow film-based thing. But then I could start out. I started out implementing Tamil's rendering algorithm and uh, Buitong Fong's uh, lighting uh, reflection model which I actually didn't quite understand. So I kind of designed my own, which uh, worked slightly differently, but still was basically to do highlights on the ob objects. Um, and then uh, started saying, well, what else can I do with this? How can I improve on this picture? Uh, texture mapping was the thing that, again, uh, Cabell did. So I got that going. And I had written a very simple paint program so I could paint the textures and apply them you know, to the teapots. Martin Newell had uh, designed this teapot, so I used that as my kind of sample test object, put pit, the textures on it and so forth. Um, and I thought, uh, I wanted to, uh, again, 
do uh, math and, and, and physics simulations. So I was going to draw a picture of a water molecule, but I wanted to make kind of a fuzzy blob shaped thing uh, for the thing rather than a hard surface with shininess on it. So I was looking at it and saying, how can I make this thing look fuzzy and wrinkly? And uh, kind of realized that the wrinkles from something like that come from not so much the displacement of the object, but the fact that the surface normal changes slightly from place to base. So I was able to uh, work on an uh, algorithm to do that, which I call normal vector perturbation. It's so new from a texture mapping. Um, now, the trick with that was to uh, make sure that it worked properly because it was a cheat. It would kind of modify the texture, the, the normal vectors from place to place slightly so that you could get kind of slow, small scale wrinkles. Uh, so in order to verify that this was actually good, you had to do uh, see if it worked, see if it worked when the objects moved, and see when it, whether it animates, as they say. Now, uh, again, doing that on film to record an animation would have been a nuisance. But the uh, uh, picture system, uh, the the frame buffer had a, uh, a, a mode in it that you could do very simple animations because basically there was a little microprocessor that was basically scanning out the memory, synthesizing a, a video signal. And by changing the uh, numbers in the microprocessor, you can have it zoom in on a part of the image and just show a kind of a quarter of the screen or an eighth of the screen. And then you could move that around on the screen so you could have basically what amounted to a 16 frame flipbook, lower resolution. And so I did that and uh, made a little 16 frame animation of the uh, of the bump mapping and uh, tried that out and it didn't look right. And so I kind of played around a little bit and went to the math and realized, oh yes, I made an odd number of sign mistakes in my calculations. So I uh, fixed that, put that in there and it looked really cool. 16 frame low resolution movie. So then uh, that became a buff mapping. Did you have the feeling that it was groundbreaking or it was just cool? When did you understand how important those technologies were? Well, what was interesting at the time was there are not a lot of people doing this. So it was like this kind of private joke among everybody in a sense. And we all knew we were doing fun things. Uh, but, uh, and I'll kind of get to this later, uh, the equipment was you know, expensive. A lot of not lot not a lot of those uh, things were going around, so um, I never really thought of it as something that a lot of people would be seeing uh, at the time. Mostly, it was something that you know I was just working on on my own projects, and I was going to uh, be able to uh, visualize and see, you know, kind of milking the thing uh, as best I could. Uh, like another uh, thing was uh, Martin, you know, my thesis writer Martin who came in one morning and said. Yeah, I had this idea. What would, what if you uh, instead of followed the light from the light source to the object, you, if you ran it backwards, bounced off the object, and then you could see where the object was reflecting from, which direction was reflecting from in space? It's like ah, great, great idea. So since I had the uh, setup already, I immediately uh, implemented that. I had to figure out the math of it, but uh, got that going, and that became reflection mapping, which uh, ultimately uh, Turner Witted saw. The results of that, and he he uh, was inspired to go off and uh, invent ray tracing from that. So uh, a lot of what I did, uh, you know, one of my great accomplishments that I think was uh, inspiring other people to take what I did and and, and move it ahead, you know, further. Um, again, while I was at Utah, I uh, uh, was reading a uh, article in the uh, TV guide about how uh, Carl Sagan was thinking of doing a uh, a uh, TV series showing uh, astronomy. And I remember thinking at the time, well, it'd be really cool to get involved with that somehow, but I have no idea how that could happen. But anyway, back to back to Utah and making uh, making images. Turns out that Martin uh, decided to uh, leave Utah and go to work in Xerox Park while I was finishing up my thesis. So I had to kind of finish it up really quickly, uh, quicker than I had expected. So I kind of spent this one 72-hour stretch madly typing the co contents of my thesis in, into, a, into the computer uh, to, to print it out and get it all out. And so I had, you know, in the thesis, I had uh, texture mapping, and I had bump mapping, and I had uh, light, uh, reflection mapping, and I had actually had worked on a, uh, a, an algorithm for drawing curved surfaces kind of from scratch, which uh, 
somewhat different than how it's done nowadays, but it was an interesting academic exercise. Uh, and uh, another thing that I had done was uh, starting from Fong's and my modification of Fong's model, I thought uh, maybe some people in physics had, had actually done some studies on, on how light reflects. Maybe I could get some ideas from them. And so I spent like several weeks in the library uh, kind of looking around from one uh, journal to the next. This is research at the time before Google, you know, uh, pick something off the boat, off the shelf and, and look at it. Nothing interesting there. And I stumbled across something called Journal of the Illumination Engineering Society. So now oh, that sounds promising. So I pulled that off and pulled through and finally found it like in a 1910 edition of that. Somebody had actually done some physics experiments where they had measured the light reflection and they had all these diagrams and say, wow, this is experimental data. Cool. Maybe I can just, you know, digitize this. And, but I kept looking around. Finally, I stumbled across a, a, a book from uh, somebody from uh, Minneapolis, the University of Minnesota, uh, uh, with the exact title of it, but it was uh, Theory for Off Specular Reflection in, in uh, Light Reflection. So I thought, ah, oh. took a look at that, and it turned out that uh, he had uh, used a very similar model that I had for reflection. Uh, for for light reflection uh, or, or specularity, but had improved on it and, and and done some other calculations to make it work in more situations. So I uh, spent some time kind of simplifying the math so it if, would fit on a computer, and so that became another chapter in my thesis, which uh, ultimately turned out later on. Uh, the people at, at Cornell, Rob Cook, was uh, also trying to do. Uh, things built on what I had done. So I had finished my thesis really fast. And so, um, and I was, you know, what, what am I going to do next? Well, I'd actually always been interested in JPL, but it, I wasn't really sure, again, you know, what interest they would have in me because I didn't have a degree in astronomy. It was in computer graphics. So I called up um, um, Ivan Sutherland, who had just started out as a uh, department chair at the Caltech. Um, and, uh, you know, I was aware of him at, uh, already, certainly for a long time. Uh, in fact, he was at Utah. Just before I got there, he had left to go to California. And so then I called him at Caltech when I finished at Utah and said, is there a place for you in your department? And he said, well, I was sure. Um, and, but I said, to be honest with you, I'm really interested in JPL. JPL was a part of Caltech. And so probably what I'll do is come to the department and, and then but go and hang out at JPL and see if there's a project I can get myself involved with somehow. Then he said, well, interesting thing about that. Um, I've been talking to this guy, JPL, who has just purchased an exact copy of the hardware that you have at Utah, and he's looking for somebody to do something interesting with it. Oh, oh well. So I, I went there, I became a, a postdoc there, and helped uh, uh, Ivan teach his graphics class, but also I hung out at uh, JPL uh, with Bob Holzman, who was the, uh, the guy who got me thing, and uh, this was just about the time the Voyager spacecraft was launched. And so uh, I found out that Charlie Colhase, they had mission planning, he had made a simple line drawing uh, animation of uh, what the spacecraft was expected to see as it went by Jupiter and Saturn, black and white line drawing. So here I did just arrived with the same equipment I had at Utah and all this experience of doing texture mapping. And so, you know, the, uh, the heavens opened up and my purpose of life became clear. I must remake Carol Ho uh, Cole Hayes's movie uh, in, uh, in color using shaded images and also include a, a model of the spacecraft. And so that became the, uh, the first fly JPL flyby movie, which was not actually officially requested by anybody at JPL, but we, we made it. And once uh, it was there, uh, they decided to uh, include that in the press packet for the, uh, the event when it happened. So that movie got uh, shown on the evening news for all across the country, which uh, was uh, kind of more exposure than most computer graphics had done at the time. So just by luck being in the right place where this ha happened, uh, I was able to uh, sort of uh, introduce the, the world at large to computer graphics. Uh, that's through that. Uh, now, what was interesting about that was uh, all along, uh, I had kind of lucked into this one thing where I you know, got on the computer because I was in the right place at the right time. I got into computer graphics when I was in the right place at the right time. And I got to JPL, and I was there 
18 months before the encounter. I got there just in enough time so that I could gather the data, write all the software, which I still had to do, using a equipment that I was familiar with, and get the first movie out and just in time for the flyby, because this is like being you know, one of those deadlines that, that you know, isn't going to go away. And spacecraft's not going to wait for you to, to do it. Movie was done, you know, a month later. It would not be interesting anymore. So, uh, again, there's all these, uh, you know, timing events that I, you know, happened to kind of line up to make this happen. It was quite amazing. But you forced your luck here. I mean, you, you, you proposed it to them. Nobody was asking for it, so... Do you, do you, is that a piece of advice you would give students is to really uh, be, uh, be forthcoming with proposing new things? Be lucky and uh, be in the right place at the right time. Sure, that works for me. Uh, that's the problem with any sort of advice that anybody gives is, you know, whatever works for them, I'll give you a place to, 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 uh, to, to do that. You know, there's, there's some advice I could give to the students that uh, may or may not be relevant. I'll get to maybe later on that to be more general. But anyway, so... One of the other interesting aspects of being at JPL was it was right next to Hollywood, and it was a high-tech uh, you know, industry, high-tech location, and so a lot of Hollywood people came by JPL to get demonstrations on what uh, the new technologies were. You heard that some guy from Paramount was interested in coming by and seeing uh, what uh, what we had been doing. You know, okay, fine, Paramount. So uh, in walks the guy says. Hi, uh, my name's Gene Roddenberry, and I'm uh, making this movie with Star Trek, and I'm looking for any interesting uh, videos I can use for concrete displays. Unfortunately, we didn't have anything you could use, but I got to meet Gene Roddenberry. Um, and also, uh, George Powell came by, who had done a lot of uh, early animations. Uh, but uh, some of my favorites were, uh, turned out that uh, my uh, uh, boss, Bob Olsman, his next-door neighbor said, you know, uh, I hear you're doing some interesting animation things. My father was an animator at Disney, and uh, he might like to come by and see what you're doing. And that was Ward Kimball. Now, it turns out that, uh, so I gave him a demonstration, and he got really excited about it. And uh, it, it turns out that uh, I kind of knew of Ward Kimball at the time because I knew he was a, one of the, the main Disney animators, and also uh, he was interested in model railroading, which I so was one of the DV, Disney TV programs talked about model railroading and how Walt well, was interested in that. And so uh, after I gave him a demonstration, he uh, invited me to his house to show off his model trains and his, uh, his full-scale model railroads. And so I got to go and hang out with the stuff that I'd actually seen on TV as a kid. And uh, he, we had lunch, and uh, he was saying, yeah, when I uh, directed uh, Man in Space, I didn't uh, realize this. And I was thinking to myself, oh, my God, he directed Man in Space. That's the video that actually got me into doing animation uh, for science visualization. But I didn't know that at the time. Uh, you know, you couldn't look up people's uh, things on Google at the time. So I kind of, I think I recovered it. Yes, yes, Man in Space, that was great. And, you know, that got me interested in doing animation. So, uh, again, it was another, another uh, lucky break. And then also, um, turns out that uh, Charlie Colhase was uh, good buddies with another guy at JPL who happened to be Carl Sagan's business partner in his venture to do uh, TV so on uh, the local PBS station. So they hooked us up, and so we got a kind of a contract to do a lot of uh, uh, computer graphics for uh, Cosmos, which is how we connected with that. Uh, the, the most of it was black and white line drawings, just diagrammatic things, but there were a few color shaded image things, which were, you know, a lot harder to make, but to be able to get through it. The big one was a DNA replication scene, which was kind of one of the hardest things they did at the time, but, but uh, I pulled off just in time to, to show it Cosmos. So uh, also while I was doing this, I, uh, I uh, started, uh, it was another, uh, college at uh, in Pasadena called the Art Center College of Design, which is a design school. And this is, again, before computers were used in design, but I kind of gave a talk there at what computer graphics could do. And so I was invited to kind of come back and see if I could generate a course for them. Uh, if they didn't have any equipment at the time, but we were able to get the Atari Corporation to, to no donate three of these Atari 800 game computers. So a, uh, a buddy of mine and I stayed up nights beforehand hacking together some software in BASIC that we could have the students uh, do. It was incredibly crude, 
but it kind of was able to give people the flavor of it. And it was able to get them sort of leveraged up and we ultimately graduated to some PC clones that were able to do graphics uh, uh, better. And uh, so we had several years worth of courses at Art Center College Design. Meanwhile, I was sort of picking up little tidbits of how to do graphic design at the time. Uh, we had uh, one of the kind of funny things was uh, the, the students realized that they were doing something really uh, new and uh, not as high resolution as they might like. And he uh, compared it to trying to do a scrimshaw with a chainsaw. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, ultimately we got that going. Then uh, the next big, big project was uh, called the Mechanical Universe. Uh, at the time, we uh, uh, were we still had this is all done on a uh, had a, a PDP eleven at the time. It was a sixteen bit machine, so everything was you know basically sixty four k memory you know, with an eight bit frame buffer, visual uh, uh, limited image quality, and uh, I actually kind of almost didn't expect we were able to improve it, but it was various. I kind of was planned on actually leaving JPL and going to join the people of the Pixar because they had better equipment. But the head of JPL said at the time, he said, wow, what, we don't want to lose you. What do you, you need? And I said, well, I need a better computer and high resolution frame buffer. So he bought me a VAX and a, a full color frame buffer and a, a video uh, recording facility. So the Mechanical Universe now became practical. The Mechanical Universe was uh, funded by the Annenberg Project, which was uh, Charles Annenberg had made a lot of money off of TV Guide. He was the uh, um, became the uh, ambassador to Britain at the time of the Reagan administration, I guess. And he saw something called the Open University and he thought we should do something like that back in the United States. So he funded a lot of uh, projects to do with telecourses on their thing, Caltech being physics. And so I worked with uh, Professor David Goodstein at Caltech to do the Mechanical Universe. And that uh, became 52 half hour programs, uh, largely. Uh, live action, you know, demonstrations and so forth. But uh, once I had the machinery going on it, uh, I was able to do an incredible amount of animation. I was able to use all my physics, uh, undergraduate physics background and computer graphics and so forth. And so there was something like 500 different animation scenes throughout the thing, total of eight hours of animation. And uh, so, uh, those simple diagrams, I had a lot of something which I called algebraic ballet. Whatever we had algebra to do, I had the equations dancing around the and the uh, terms were jumping over equal signs and canceling out and so forth. And that uh, has become a standard. And if you look at you know YouTube videos and mathematics nowadays, I'm not sure if they saw my stuff or if it's just kind of the obvious way of doing it. But also then um, a lot of little simil similar simulations of, of um, uh, thermodynamics, uh, molecules bouncing around and uh, uh, objects spinning uh, to show... Uh, uh, your momentum, and we had a really nice series on uh, general special relativity, showing space-time diagrams and so forth. So this was kind of like uh, one of my favorite uh, things that I did was to kind of use my knowledge and you know all possible things uh, in, in physics and math to uh, do that. I saw the the Mechanical Universe project. It's on YouTube, and it's actually fascinating to watch. And and the project math I showed my kid. My twelve-year-old kid as well. He, and I mean, for the time, it was like groundbreaking. And I'm, how do you explain that we do not have, you know, with today's technology and the, the, you know the much improved computer graphics that there is not a set of reference videos to explain the basics of physics or thermodynamics? You look on YouTube, and there's dozens of fabulous videos on on, on mathematics and physics. Uh, I don't have time to watch them all, but I'm fascinated by it, and. And so, uh, yeah, you know, there's there's lots of stuff, and uh, there's some things I've seen advertised which I haven't looked into of interactive online coursework, something called Brilliant, which looks pretty cool, interactive uh, math and 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 uh, physics videos and so forth. So uh, I'm, I'm, you know, whether I inspired that personally or not, I don't know. I, I can hope I did, but uh, uh, when the tools are available, you know, people will pop up to use them, and uh, the uh, the mathematicians uh, all over the uh, all over the, the world are, are, are generating these things, and they're all. I mean, that's you know what I spend a lot of my free time looking at uh, math videos on YouTube, uh, and and 
it's an interesting because the technology, uh, there's quite a wide range of technology. A lot of them have very nice, sophisticated animation, but a lot of them are people basically uh, aiming a camera at a piece of paper and writing with a pen on it. Uh, some of them from, uh, it sounds like they're from India or something like that, so, but they might have that as fancy technology, but they're still, to me anyway, fascinating uh, uh, lessons to, to look at. YouTube is much easier to scroll back and forth on things and make it slow and fast and, 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 and see it at the right time. And so uh, uh, YouTube is, is, a, is a great way of seeing that. So that's kind of my experience in my, my career. Uh, I've done a lot of other writing in math and so forth and still doing some mathematical tinkering. But that's kind of a precis of what I did. Uh, you're interested, I know, in this podcast in the metaverse, and, uh, and my experience in that directly has been kind of indirect. Um, I've seen a lot of demos at SIGGRAPH. You put on the, you know, strap on the the uh, iPhones and, and and look around and so forth, and it seems cool and so forth, which uh, uh, is interesting. And uh, so, you know, it's one of those things that if you look at, like, the development technology, you start out with black and white movies. And they were cool. And uh, then coming along this new technology called color. Wow, everybody jumped on the bag lane. Color is cool. So color movies uh, went uh, nuts with that. And everybody's in color now except for a few special days. And then it came out 3D movies. 3Ds were cool. and But then they weren't cool again. And, and so for some reason, 3D didn't. And I you know, went through this, like every 20 or 30 years, 3D has a comeback. And, and then it kind of fades away. I love 3D movies myself go to a look as, as, as often as I can. But uh, for some reason, you know, putting on the glasses doesn't seem to work for a lot of people. Uh, it works for me. Um, and so you kind of wonder if the, the metaverse is going to be something like that. You know, people have been doing the metaverse. If uh, any of you have been to the SIGGRAPH conference just last year, the 50th anniversary SIGGRAPH, one of the, uh, it was just a fabulous event and, and uh, incredible uh, Bonnie Mitchell put together this, this fabulous historical retrospective of hardware and software and whatnot. But if you look, there was an entire room full of uh, 3D display goggles uh, that people had been, you know, dozens of them, you know, had been doing it since, you know, Ivan Sutherland uh, did it at, at, in, in 1960-something, rather, at, uh, at, at, at uh, Harvard, I guess. Um, so the metaverse, you know, has this kind of uh, 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 thing to kind of uh, barrier to jump over, and I'm not sure uh, what that will take. But you know, various companies are making these goggles, making them cheaper and faster, and, and more resolution. Uh, and so the, the question is, you know, is this giving you an experience that's enough better than just looking at a flat screen or looking at YouTube to make it worth the the effort? And uh, you know, I hope it does. And I'm sure there'll be a bunch of people who have done it. Uh, you know, you watch a lot of TV shows about this now, a program called Upload. I don't know if you've seen that. And, uh, yeah, um, uh, you know, Ready Player One and so forth. And so it's become a, 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 a staple of what the future of computer visuals is going to be like. Well, VR is certainly a part of uh, the metaverse. It's the whole, you know, internet and everything, real-time 3D and interactivity, which... Uh is more the commonly accepted uh, definition of the metaverse. So it goes, it's not like immersivity is one, one aspect of it, but I would say interactivity and the fact that everything can become social and multi-user. It's interesting watching the development of that and, and what catches on and what doesn't. You know, there's been things that are uh, just looking at the TV screen and the computer screen uh, with group chat and group things that uh, have been uh, uh, coming and going too. So that's uh, something I don't have a lot of experience in, uh, but it'll be interesting to see kind of what becomes of it. One of the things that um, I realized is that I'm absolutely terrible at making predictions about the future. Uh, one of the things that I, I kind of learned by Michigan was when I was at Michigan, I had uh, this uh, computer that I kind of inherited by everybody else graduating and leaving, but I never expected it to be upgraded. So I tried to my, my mindset was, let's milk this for all it's worth. Let's, you know, expect that we, we're not going to get a new uh, graphics display. I'm just going to play with this as, as best I can. And uh, likewise, when I was at uh, at uh, JPL, I, you know, four or five years, we used the same equipment. And, and I never really thought about uh, getting a better thing until finally at the end, I, you know, uh, 
who was married ahead of JPL Botany of X. And so uh, my viewpoint in this thing is more uh, how, what are, what are the best images we can make with the hardware we've got? And, uh, and I know that's different from like uh, Catmull and Pixar's thing where they were saying, here's what we want to make and we're going to wait for the technology to mature to the point where uh, we can now get that. Uh, and and my, uh, my uh, viewpoint, what I was doing was, you know, different was like, you know, here's a very hard what we've got now. Let's see what we can do with it. I want to disagree with you on your ability to predict the future because I came back to uh, your 1998 uh, Seagraph keynote for the 25th anniversary, and you had, and we can review that. Let's review. Let's let's see. Let's review your scorecard live. So you predicted that you know CG would replace Hollywood backlots. Well, that's done. I mean, visual effects. You know, the timing. I would give you the timing. It will come to that in a minute. You said theme parks will become virtual. Well, it's happening. It's not fully there. And this was 1998. I mean, nobody had almost nobody had cell phones in 1998. I mean, it's easy to look back. So it was incredibly prescient to, to make those predictions. You also said that SIGGRAPH 2003 would be held in virtual reality. <laughs> so that was, that's why. <laughs> well, I was off by 20 years. I think 2020 or 2021 was kind of virtual reality. There's, there's this phenomenon of predictions where you know, you're basically over-optimistic in the short term and, and, and pessimistic in the long term. When I was in Michigan, I, I remember seeing something uh, uh, Alan Tay did. He predicted, this is back, back in you know, 1968, uh, predicted that uh, someday you're going to be able to carry a computer around the size of a notebook that has all the power of a PDP-10. And I remember we were thinking, this guy is nuts. And in 1998, where, you know, nobody, I mean, the research people knew about the internet, but the, the, the public barely knew about the internet. You said anything not on the web will be forgotten. I mean, this was a crazy prediction. It turned out to be true. So you you know you got three out of four and one. You you got off by twenty years, which is. But yeah, you know, I must admit that some of those predictions were extended as, intended as jokes. I I think it was uh, it was amazing, and I, I I encourage people to go back to your 1998 keynote. I think it was it was it was a lot of fun, and it's it helps measure you know in 25 years. But you also did the 50th anniversary keynote. The, the, the transcript of it was online on the SIGGRAPH site. It was disappearing, but it's, it's on uh, archive.org or something. And I've got a link to it someplace here if, if anybody's interested. And it was it was a good talk. I I, I hope it gets back on. I've actually got a video of it, but uh, the, the the cassette's damaged, and I'm not sure if I'll be able to digitize it or not. Yeah, but you can find the text and the slides. It's it's super it's super easy. So, so now that we've established that, let's talk about AI. What do you think? How do you approach that craziness around it? generative AI and AI for creators? Well, I can either say we're completely doomed, and we're going to you know be answering to our robot overlords any day now. Uh, hard to say. It's uh, it sounds impressive at first, but then you dig into it, and, and a lot of what the AI you know, tell you is shock. But uh, people who are doing uh, images with AI, you know, you basically can tell it what you want to picture of. My brother has been doing a lot of that. Uh, he's been working on some books on the on the languages and uh, and illustrating that with with uh, AI generated images, and they're all you know stunning. Uh, and but you know with, with something like that, if the picture is not what you want, you could say, you know, well, I'll make it a little green, a little, a little bit different thing, and so forth. You get it. Uh, a lot of the uh, AI textual things are in the first place remarkable. I saw something that a friend of mine, uh, Andrew Glaster, did, who's done some research at AI and also uh, also um, quantum computing. Uh, he said, write me uh, a description of what a Hadamard gate does in the form of a Shakespearean sonnet. And it was just astonishing with a Shakespearean sonnet that described, you know, you know uh, superposition and so forth. And it's like, that's all you told it? And you see, oh, that's how I've told it. And it came up with the Shakespearean sonnet. But then there's also things where uh, the people ask it, uh, write me some code, some Python code to do this and that. So they write the Python code. But then the Python code asks it to include a whole bunch of uh, libraries which don't exist. What's surprising to me about AI is the research is mostly driven by corporation. And you've been at, for many, many years at uh, Microsoft Research, which was a big, I mean, with a huge brain graphics uh, luminaries at Microsoft Research. But 
everything you did in the early days was at universities. So, you know, do you think we're, do you think this is a, a trend that universities are not the place where research is happening anymore? I am much more of an academic at heart than, a, than an industrialist. And so I, I hope universities continue to, to uh, make their mark. I think if you look at a lot of the SIGGRAPH papers, a lot of them are still from universities, but there are some corporations that, uh, like Pixar, that intentionally publishes everything they do to uh, you know improve the, the, the field, uh, whereas other industries maybe don't so much, which I think is kind of short-sighted, but uh, you know, uh, industries are interested in you know patenting things. So, Jim, you mentioned you know a lot of your early work were things that you just thought were cool that you wanted to work on, and then your your research resulted in direct impact and techniques that we all use in the field today, but also then went on and inspired so many other people that then created these very influential techniques. I mean, would you have advice for for researchers today in order to? you know, try to create the impact? Researchers today have a different uh, situation in mind. Mine is there were very few people doing it, so anything you did was new. Uh, nowadays, it's hard to find something that hasn't been done already. So uh, the research have to spend as much time, you know, looking through the literature to see if what their great idea is has already been done. And so a lot of it's going to be, you know, incremental and so forth. Um, there are some things that I wish I had done differently, which may or may not apply to people right now. I wish I had uh, documented my stuff more. There are a lot of you know interesting programs I wrote that I wish I had uh, took pictures of or videoed, and uh, the documents I do. I wish I put dates on things, so I don't know exactly when I did this or exactly when I did that. Now nowadays, that you know advice might not be as relevant because any anything you do, you save a picture to a file and there's a, a creation date on it, or you know documenting something like that is just this is screen captured and you know beforehand. Documenting a, 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 a real time uh, well, thing that you did involved getting a film camera and aiming at the screen. Um, there is actually, was at one time, a, uh, a really neat film of myself demonstrating the, the 3D uh, circuit drawing program that I uh, worked out at, at, at Michigan after all the graduate students left. They still wanted to have a demonstration of it to show at conferences and so. They actually brought in the film camera and filmed it, uh, and I'm um, demonstrating how this thing worked. You know, drawing a diagram and had the computer. Nobody knows where that film is now. It's disappeared, so uh, it's kind of a shame. Uh, but you know, nowadays you're documenting something and you save it on your on the 60 terabyte drive, and you can you know keep copies of it all. But just you know, being aware of you know documenting your stuff uh, and and uh, and keeping track of it. Um, but generally, the things that I did was both in, in Utah and in later things is I would make a picture. I'd look at the screen and say, what don't I like about this picture? Well, you know, the things are too smooth. I like them to look more wrinkly. See, so we can figure out how to do that. Or uh, uh, from a design, from design point of view, uh, when I was doing some uh, uh, animations for the mechanical universe, I'd put that up on the screen and and uh, and you know, think, you know, what uh, what's important about this that I want people to see. One of the things about animation is uh, is uh, directing people's attention to what part of the screen you want them to pay attention to. So I do some of the things like you put a picture up on the screen and that then look away, away. You look at the screen and say, and close my eyes and say, what's the first thing I saw? You know, is that the important thing or not? And for example, there's one thing where I had some equations on the screen and then I had a nice, you know, multicolored background behind it that looked really pretty, like a little sunset. So I looked at that and said, what did I see? I saw a sunset. Oh, well, equation? I didn't see the equation. So I put a more boring background on the screen. And so the equation became more the, the obvious thing to see. Uh, the basic principle is, you know, make the foreground more interesting than the background in a sense. Um, so those are things that, that uh, I did uh, to try to improve the images that I made is uh, just... Yeah, a lot of what I did is incremental improvement. I make uh, the the first flyby pictures that I made were incredibly ter uh, terrible looking, but I just got something on the screen saying, "What do, what I hate, hate about this?" Well, spacecraft has to have enough detail. Let's put more detail in spacecraft. Uh, now what I don't like about this? Well, the, uh, the 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 map on Jupiter doesn't look right. 
So just incremental improvements and, um, you know, what's the next incremental improvement can I make to this image uh, until either the deadline comes or uh, I can't think of anything else more I want to do. And how many SIGGRAPH did you attend? Probably in the neighborhood of 40 of them. Um, I went to all of them up till about 2009 and then a little bit sporadically since then, since I have other uh, demands of my time these days. Well, one of the things about SIGGRAPH that's fun is the playful nature of it and, you know, the whole thing about uh, Libbins and this little th- People who haven't seen the job, basically, you, know, you get a, a ribbon showing whether you're a speaker or a member of the committee and so forth. And so people started making fake ribbons with jokes on them and, and attacking them on and handing them out, which uh, I, I bought into. And, and I uh, I still have them all. Uh, I would donate those to Body Mitchell to put in the SIGGRAPH archives. Yeah, you know, SIGGRAPH has been so influential, right, to this field and to so many of us. Just moving forward, do you have ideas or ways that you think SIGGRAPH would continue to you know, contribute in a big way? Well, SIGGRAPH has branched out a lot, uh, so there's lots of uh, different things that it does, and uh, that's one thing that's that's good and what's necessary for it to do, I think. Um, there's have multiple sessions going on of uh, you know, art shows versus technical things and, and uh, film shows and uh, equipment exhibits and so forth. Uh, all happen simultaneously. So in that regard, I think it's going in a good direction, although it becomes overwhelming in terms of seeing what it is you're going to see. Um, a lot of it's recorded. You can uh, play it back uh, later. I watched a couple of the sessions and I missed and on the, on the, uh, on the I have recording. Um, but uh, I'm glad there's so many people with the energy to do this sort of thing. It's not something I'd be good at myself. But I'm very forever grateful to all the people on the Serial Committee for putting us incredible a uh, show uh, and, and fun experience for all of us that I can participate in. Well, that wraps up our fascinating talk with computer graphics legend Jim Blin. We we covered the highlights of your career from the early days of SIGGRAPHs through through the future of CG. So, Jim, you have an incredible ability to make complex topics understandable and entertaining. We love your humor and storytelling talent. Even though you don't play it, you know, you played a key role in making CG what it is today. And you know, as CG becomes real time and more lifelike, and as it invades the internet to form the metaverse, we should not forget pioneers like you, who turned an academic curiosity into an industry and an art form, and your creativity and persistence paved the way. So, a huge thank you to you, Jim Blin, for being with us today. Well, thank you very much for all those kind comments. Thank you as well to our ever growing audience. And you can find us on our LinkedIn page, of course, on major podcast platforms and on YouTube, as well on our own buildingtheopenmetaverse.org website. Thanks to you all. Thank you, Patrick, again. And thank you, Jim. We'll be back soon for another episode of Building the Open Metaverse.